These are the German forests in which the last desperate battles of the Second World War were fought. Here, among the chaos and darkness, the Allies obliterated Nazism. Out of the senseless fragments of violent human experience, they forged a coherent memory of the war. It is the memory of the good war, which we have lived with for 50 years. But in the process, the victors buried those fragments that didn't fit. They were suppressed even in the minds of thousands of men who fought among these trees. The dream started with walking down a canal bank between trees, among trees. And suddenly I'm lying on my face and bullets are flying around me and mortar shells are falling. And uh, someone is dying and shouting on his mother, for his mother. And I woke up and I wrote it out. And as I wrote it, I, I, it the details started coming back to me and I realized this was, no, this was no dream. I was just reconstructing the actual episode that happened, thing, as it was. And that was the beginning of memory coming back. Out of the carnage in Europe 50 years ago, the Allies selected certain memories. They used them to build the official version of the Good War. This film is about how that happened. It tells why certain memories had to be buried and forgotten because they contradicted the optimism of the big historical picture. The fault of the big picture is that it omits evil. It's all good. We won the war, therefore we must have deserved to win it. Therefore we are wonderful people without fault, and so on. Right there you can read uh, the history of modern Europe and the Allies' continued relation with it. A lot of the Cold War is based upon that. American behavior in Vietnam, which assumes that anybody who's opposed to communism must be wonderful, you see, and who's astonished when the people opposing communism prove to be as wicked as the communists. I'm thinking of Lieutenant Kelly and people like that. Yes, it has, it has a lot to do with post-war assumptions and post-war national behaviors, I would say, that, that great big picture, which so conveniently omits individual evil. The story begins six years before the war, when the Nazis came to power in Germany. They promised to end the chaos the country had suffered since 1918. Hitler's right-hand man was Hermann Goering. Like many of the Nazis, Goering was convinced that a new Germany would arise only if it reawakened the glories of the past. In the forest north of Berlin, Goering began building a vast palace. Today, this is all that is left of Karin Hall. Es war ein Haus von Göring, Karin Hall. Hier stand mal ein großes Haus, ein Schloss. Schade, dass das gesprengt ist geworden. Das war nicht sehenswert. Und jetzt alles eine Ruine. Göring designed Karin Hall to evoke the power and splendor of Germany's distant past. The marble halls were lined with tapestries that displayed the images and symbols of the Teutonic Knights of old. Und an den Wände waren auch Teppiche. Ja. Ich habe immer noch den Ehen in Erinnerung mit den, den großen Teufel da drauf. <lacht> mit den Teufelbeeren da in der so. neue Galerie. In der Galerie. Oh. Nazis like Göring look back to ancient German history to a time when knights rode through the forests of northern Europe. The knights were powerful figures who had established political and intellectual supremacy. The Nazi aim was to conjure up this noble past, to mark the start of a new era. The 
tried to give a new memory, a new history, a new past. There were big parades and big marches and big uh, inszenierungen, in uh, big things they made in the town to bring the history back. You would have got the belief that you are coming from a very important past and going to a very important future. The whole Third Reich was a theater of memories that picked together from the past whatever was good and interesting for them, forgetting the rest, and they mixed them in a way never seen before. And there was a, a, a fascinating cocktail of a never happened history. Ihr Waldboden solle Schätze vergangener Jahrtausende bergen. Konnte ihre Mutter Erde eindringlicher zu ihr sprechen. Ein Wunder, welches sie und uns stolz macht, der Rasse anzugehören, die bereits vor tausenden von Jahren auf derart hoher Kulturstufe stand. But the Nazis' project was far more than a simple reawakening of history. Their aim was to use the power of the past to transform those they governed into new and better people. This is the former Congress building, Congress Hall. The Nazis planned it for their uh, congresses, for the sub-organizations of their uh, party rallies. It was planned for 50 to 60,000 people here to listen to the, to the speeches of the big uh, Nazi leaders. It's a mix between Babylonian, Egypt, medieval, Greek, Roman architecture. The impression they were trying to give was uh, of a very far away history, very mighty, very important, very big history. The Nazis were deliberately manufacturing a mythical image of Germany's past in order to control its people. They believed that democracy and socialism had failed because individuals, when left to themselves, became corrupt and barbarous. Only the nation had the power to control this evil. It could pull people together and transform their wickedness into a new, powerful force. The giant Nazi rallies were an expression of this ideal. Dwarfed by the symbols of the country's mighty past, individuals would lose themselves in the vast sea of the nation's soul. Da hat man Abend alle Lichter ausgelöscht und dann waren außen etwa 130 Scheinwerfer, die man im Krieg für die Flugzeuge gebraucht hat. Die hat man so aufgestellt, dass die ganz senkrecht nach oben gegangen sind. Und das war nun so, als wenn dieses ganze Stadium von einer Lichtwand eingehüllt wäre. Das, das hat also einen fantastischen Eindruck gemacht. By the end of the 1930s, Germany had become a coherent, directed society. It also represented a fundamental challenge to the ideas of democracy. Individual rights and reason no longer mattered. Instead, the nation was to be supreme. And one of the most fervent believers in this new faith was Hermann Goering. He believed in the necessity to support the, the lasting life and domination of the German, as you might call it, nation state, the German body national. Goering said once, and that was years earlier, when I think when he was prime minister of Prussia, he made a statement to the effect, I am the police. Every bullet that leaves the muzzle of a police weapon is my bullet. If that be murder, then I am a murderer. strange feeling. I, can't, I cannot describe it and, and hardly declare it was it, what it is, but this mix of history gave them a destiny for eternity. The last step to the promised land. In 1945, the war was drawing to an end. Everything that the Nazis had built in Germany had been destroyed. The past had been obliterated, physically and mentally, by what had become known as total war.
diese Aufnahme habe ich gemacht. Das ist eine Frau, die von dem Fliegerangriff so mit den Nerven runter ist, dass sie zittert. Ich habe ihr die Verlustliste gezeigt, die in der Zeitung veröffentlicht war nach dem ersten Großangriff am 31. Mai 1942. Ich habe sie gebeten anzustreichen, welche von den Leuten ihre Angehörigen waren bzw. die sie gekannt hat. The Allies now stood on the brink of victory in Europe. But the experience of total war was also destroying the confident certainties of their own past. The Americans had come into the war determined to put an end to European barbarism. But they found that the beliefs and assumptions they had brought with them were fading. Europe was a much darker and stranger place than America. Well, my crucial memory and the memory that really starts all of my other memories about the war is waking up in this pine forest my first morning in the war. It was still dark, but just barely getting light. And as it got light, I was astonished to see within three or four feet of me several bodies, dead bodies, of German boys who'd been killed, I think, the day before by the unit we were relieving. These boys were just exactly like me, and they were killed. Their eyes were open, and their faces were as white as marble, greenish white. And at that moment, when I saw what I was involved in, actually for the first time, my training had never told me this, many of my adolescent illusions about reason and the governance of the world by reason and common sense and the idea of progress fell away all at once. And I realized in that one moment that I would never be again in that world of childhood innocence where the world is, 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 is run by reason and where events contain a certain amount of justice. I knew that I was now deeply enmeshed in a world of injustice and unreason then I would have to figure out how to survive in that world or how to make sense of it later on. As the war drew to an end, the challenge for the Allies was to make sense of what it had all been for. The soldiers who had lived through the battles had no idea what all the terrible experiences meant. We live, wrote one, on the desperate edge of now. At the time of battle, combat, it's not coherent. You're always being surprised by the, the first shell that comes in, the, the, the machine gun, uh, and uh, it's fragments, it's accidental. Everything is accidental. I suppose that's, what fr that's what's the worst thing about combat, is that it's pure accident. It's pure accident that that bullet three inches away wasn't through your head. So if you want to make sense of it later on, it's, uh, you could only do it on some higher level. You can't do it from the level of this, the private, the foot soldier, the tank man. You can't, you, you can't make sense of it. In May 1945, the Germans finally surrendered. The Americans, along with the Russians, were now the dominant powers. They were determined to put the surviving Nazi leaders on trial. They chose the city of Nuremberg, whose ruins their troops now occupied. The trials were to be more than just a legal process. They were to be a history lesson an attempt by the Allies to piece together and explain what the war had been for. It will be the greatest history seminar ever in the world, announced one American prosecutor. But the Americans were to have a determined opponent, Hermann Goering. He had been brought to Nuremberg by his jailer, Colonel Andrus. When my father first met him, his fingernails were bright red with fingernail polish, and in his baggage, was a tremendous quantity of, of a drug. It was diagnosed as pericodine, which in itself is a fairly mild drug, but he was taking 20 or more a day. When he was given his physical examination, the doctors discovered his toenails were also bright red. <laughs> 
Colonel Andrus put Goering on a strict regime to wean him of his drug addiction. He quickly recovered and became the dominant figure amongst the 21 defendants. The trial began on November the 20th, 1945. The prosecution's aim was to show that the Nazis in the dock had conspired to wage war and to commit crimes against humanity. To prove this, they reconstructed the events of the past 15 years using documents, photographs, the emerging evidence from the concentration camps, and most dramatically, Nazi film. We will show you their own film. You will see their own conduct and hear their own voices as these descendants reenact for you some of the events in the course of the conspiracy. The Nazi plan was a film shown to the court. It lasted six hours and had been edited from millions of feet of captured Nazi footage. In particular, The Triumph of the Will, Lenny Riefenstahl's record of the Nazi rallies in Nuremberg eight years before. This was taken by Hollywood editors and recut with other footage to tell a new story. It showed that hidden behind the pomp and splendor of the 30s lay Hitler's conspiracy to wage war. They took large parts of the triumph of Will and other surviving Nazi footage and put it together. And the Nazi plan attempts to be a documentary history of the Third Reich. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's a good basis, and we know where the film came from. Uh, but it is, of course, a biased, allied linking of German film. It shows the last just war, the war that had to be fought, that we were reluctant to fight, where the villains were clear and the uh, heroes were clear. That's the memory. What began in the courtroom at Nuremberg was the construction of the grand public memory of the Second World War. Out of the chaotic fragments of five years of warfare, the Allies forged a simple, powerful story. But the memories and experiences that didn't fit the story were quietly discarded and forgotten. This official plot of the war, that it was a good war that proceeded from bad to good or from defeat to success and victory, that's true. That's, that, that's, that's true. But it has almost nothing to do with the, the individual soldier's individual truth. They know better. They know sort of how much fun it was to direct artillery fire upon a hillside full of innocent German boys and blow them all up. It was fun. It involved a great deal of technical expertise. There's a way of doing it well, and there's a way of doing it badly, and so on. And you don't see the lads you're killing, so it's not as bad as it might be. But still, what you're doing is destroying human beings for the sake of the, the new post-war world. <laughs> I think the memory was built basically because the opponents were so evil that they make us look good. The trial took place in the midst of a city the Americans had declared 90% dead. Few Germans ever came to the courtroom, and the Allied staff who worked there knew nothing of the world outside under the ruins. In walking, you think you're alone, it's so quiet. All you've got to look at is rubble. You went through there and you felt alone that nothing was there except stillness, stillness, and it was dead. And then suddenly you became aware of a head, or saw a movement, and it was a head coming out from that rubble, just, just this head. It was alive and looking at you as you walked. It gave you kind of a funny feeling that, oh, there are people there under the rubble. To those living underneath the rubble, the version of history the Allies were constructing inside the courtroom was terrifying. What millions had once believed glorious was now being revealed as murderous. The Germans called it Zero Hour, the destruction of all belief in the past. I was in the American sector of the city, and I came home. My father was dead. He was Nazi, a convinced Nazi, a very good, very good creature, I guess. I loved him. But he was a Nazi, and uh, 
uh, he killed himself because he couldn't get over this, what was the past, uh, broken down his hopes. And, um, and I came from school and uh, told to my mother, to my uh, brother, uh, what I've learned about the concentration camps and um, the liquidation of the Jewish people and so on. And they said, it's all lie. That's lie of the Americans. Don't believe that. Because they couldn't uh, take this in their mind, that this is part of German history. The response to this cataclysm was a wholesale wiping of memory by most of the German population. Millions of men and women who had been part of the Nazi system hid and denied their murderous past. A feature film made in 1946 tried to expose what was happening. It tells how a former army officer responsible for mass murder becomes a successful industrialist. One of his former soldiers returns to confront him. Herr Hauptmann Bröckner. Rechenschaft? Wofür Rechenschaft? 36 Männer, 54 Frauen, 31 Kinder, Munitionsverbrauch 347 Schuss. Ja, was denn, um Gottes Willen? Da war doch Krieg. Da waren doch ganz andere Verhältnisse. Was habe ich denn heute damit zu tun? Jetzt ist doch Frieden, wir haben doch Weihnachten. Friedensweihnachten. Bett! Um Gottes Willen! Meine Frau! Die Kinder, was haben denn meine Kinder damit zu tun? Halt! But the film was a lone voice. Throughout Germany, the past was being buried and forgotten by millions of men and women. The Germans emerged from the ruins with their history rewritten. Meanwhile, in the courtroom, the Allies too carried on reconstructing Germany's past. They lived in a strange world. Each day, they listened to the careful cataloguing of Nazi atrocities. While in the dock, Rudolf Hess read Grimm's fairy tales. And every night, the Americans held parties in the ballroom of the Grand Hotel. Basically, it was a bachelor's dream, you might say. There were lots of romances. I got myself into trouble in no time. We had a lieutenant, a female lieutenant. Her name was Nancy Robinson. And she was beautiful. And she used to bring the mail, you know, to our desks and so on. Now, I had my eye on Nancy uh, almost from the first day. And I shared an office for a while with a gentleman by the name of Robinson who didn't look anything like her. And uh, she came in one day, she pranced in and pranced out, and I couldn't resist the uh, comment. And I said what I'd like to do someday, uh, you know, having the chance. And Mr. Robinson looked up and said, you know, Nancy's my sister. So uh, there the, are uh, things that happen that are not programmed. I don't think he ever spoke to me again. We shared the office, we continued to uh, share it. And Nancy committed suicide later. I don't know what happened. Oh, it was all American jazz. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the German twist, German if jazz. you want to call it. remember the singer. She used to sing, please, Mr. Truman, why can't we go home? We have conquered Berlin, and we have conquered Rome. <laughs> we have defeated the master race, so why can't we get shipping space? <laughs> why don't you remember that? Oh, my God! <laughs> But there was one German who was determined the past should not be wiped. He wanted to defend it publicly. Hermann Goering was about to be cross-examined by the chief American prosecutor, Robert Jackson. The cross-examination of Goering went wrong because Justice Jackson got a very good start. He asked uh, Goering whether or not it wasn't true that in order to rule Germany, the Nazis had to do this, that, and the other thing, and Goering said, yes, those were things were necessary. We were conducting revolution. So then Justice Jackson started to press it and asking these kinds of questions. Goering would make very long and certain. 
circuitous answers. Aber einmal, ich erinnere mich daran noch, ich als preußischer Minister... And Jackson became angry with him. Well, let's, uh, let's omit the... Let's omit that. I haven't asked for that. If you just answer my questions, we'll save a great deal of time, and your counsel will be permitted to bring out any explanations you want to make. Uh, you did... You did prohibit all court review and considered it necessary to prohibit court review of the causes for taking people into what you call protective custody. That is right, isn't it? Das habe ich ganz klar beantwortet, aber ich bitte, dass diese Ausführungen, die uh, eben gehörten, zu der Beantwortung mit. Uh, and your counsel will see to that. Jackson didn't reach Göring. Nobody could reach Göring. In other words, Göring, as a condottieri type, as I've mentioned, did not know the difference between good and bad and right and wrong. That didn't mean anything to him. So to confront him with crimes that he had been responsible for, but that he felt he had to commit these acts because they were necessary to safeguard the life and the future of the body national, was pointless. Well, if you wanted certain people killed, you had to have some organization that would kill them, didn't you? Again and again, Jackson accused Goering of corruptly using his power to commit crimes. Each time, Goering responded that such actions might be crimes in a democratic state, but that in Germany, democracy had failed. Eliminating the political opposition was necessary to fulfill a higher principle, that of the nation. And it had worked, Goering insisted. It had brought order and prosperity to Germany. Unter den damaligen Umständen war sie nach meiner Auffassung die einzig mögliche Form und sie hat auch gezeigt, dass Deutschland aus seinem tiefen Elend der Verarmung und Arbeitslosigkeit in kurzer Zeit zu einer verhältnismäßigen Blüte wieder gekommen war. Finally, Jackson lost his temper and appealed to the judges to control Göring. The difficulty is that the tribunal loses control of these proceedings outside of this courtroom is a great social question of the revival of Nazism. And that one of the purposes here of the defendant Goering, I think he'd be the first to admit, is to revive and perpetuate. What frightened Jackson was the link between the political ideas that Goering was explaining to the court and the terrible crimes the Nazis had committed. The horrors revealed at the trial were so overwhelming that those who had committed them began to be seen as alien and utterly other. And so the trial became a morality play, a battle against evil, with Goering's role that of the villain. The ideas that had led millions of ordinary human beings to support and participate in such barbarism were too dangerous to discuss. They had to be locked away and hidden. What was missing in Nuremberg was the indictment of the ideology of the Thousand Year Reich. Everybody nowadays knows what the war was being fought for, but nobody really has paid much attention to what the Germans thought the war was fought for in their sometimes, how shall I call it, a very twisted mentality that was, that was spread by Hitler and his people. The body national, a form of nationalism where the entire nation was considered one body that had to be assured of its security and life. In the name of this mentality, most of these crimes were committed. The terrible executions shown on film at the trial became a central image in the public memory of the Second World War. But they were seen and understood as the acts of monsters, not of human beings. What was buried at Nuremberg was any idea of examining why Nazism had happened in the first place. What the social and political forces were that had led ordinary people to such savagery. That's when I thought they deserved whatever punishment they got. They had to be cold and cruel and unfeeling. What kind of people are these? They're, they're not like the human beings I've known all my life. After Goering's cross-examination, the judges ruled that no defendant would be allowed to go over ground already covered by Goering. There must be no further explanation of Nazi policies.
The day of the sentencing, I was in the uh, courthouse, and the defendants assembled outside of the courtroom, and the, the roll was called, and I was asked to call the roll, so I called the roll. It was a strange feeling, you know, and I said, Göring, jawohl, you know, and they stepped to attention. Keitel, jawohl, he was a field marshal, and so on, and that was it. That was my entire part uh, in the thing. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Göring, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Goering had prepared for his suicide more than a year in advance, uh, before he was captured. He had taken three of these uh, suicide capsule containers. I have the one he finally, Goering finally killed himself with. Uh, they, they were one cc of cyanide kept in this cut-off rifle cartridge case for protection. These were mass-produced at one of the concentration camps. And he was lying on his bunk and just decided the time had come, so he moved the ampule hour between his teeth and bit it. Everybody converged on him and he was dead. Oh. They were cremated in the ovens of Dachau, which was something that he planned very carefully, because they are the ones that ordered other people to be cremated in those. And then the ashes were deployed into an unidentified river. My father wanted the good to be glorified and honored, but not the evil. And so he made great efforts to prevent any item that these criminals, particularly the ones that were condemned, anything that would remind anybody of them to be removed and destroyed forever and wiped from the memory of the world, hopefully, what they, the evil that they had been a part of. Well, here is a pair of uh, Herman Goering's underwear. Uh, left behind in the laundry when uh, he was, his body was taken away to be burned. Beautifully made, monogrammed, finest materials, and his socks, again, handsomely made, wonderful material, and here was this little pile of laundry. That was the only remaining souvenir. When the trial was over and the defendants that were sentenced to death were executed and Goering had committed suicide, he beat them to it in a way. The show was over. With them went the idea of the body national, which is now looked at as a phantom. Hitler, out. Swastikas, gone. Nazi propaganda, off the air. Concentration camps, empty. You'll see ruins. You'll see flowers. You'll see some mighty pretty scenery. Don't let it fool you. You are in enemy country. You are up against something more than tourist scenery. You are up against German history. It isn't good. Following the trial, the Allies embarked on a gigantic act of exorcism. They destroyed all trace, not just of the Nazi past, but of Germany's military history. The giant statues that lined the Tiergarten in Berlin were removed to a compound to be dynamited. But the Germans organized a secret operation to rescue them. They remained hidden until two years ago. Sie wurden dann bei Schloss Bellevue im Garten vergraben, bei Nacht und Nebel, wie man sagt. Ich war nicht dabei. Aber es muss eine geheime Aktion gewesen sein, so geheim, dass man später gar nicht mehr wusste, wo diese Skulpturen liegen. For the Americans, these sculptures symbolize the old barbarism that had plagued Europe for centuries. That was now gone forever. The good war had ushered in a new age in which such terrible things would never happen again, because evil had been banished from the world. Large parts of the European past had to be wiped and forgotten. 
a new world would be constructed, free from the bitter historical memories that had driven nations to war again and again. In the American project, the individual and democracy were more important than the nation. Underlying this was an optimistic belief that human beings were good. We all had a hope that the world would have learned something from the horror of World War II, that people had learned perhaps to be more civilized in relations between one nation and another, that there wouldn't be a repeat of the invasions, the killings, where disputes could be settled without war. Here is one of the many buildings in which tomorrow the General Assembly of the United Nations will be waging not war but peace. Entering will be representatives of all the nations dedicated to peace, large and small, meeting together in sovereign equality. These men and women... We visualized a world which would be more rational and civilized, where nations would get along with one another, where people could live with each other in peace. This is not the capital of some super state trying to rule the earth. It represents the mind and conscience of the world. It is the watchtower over tomorrow. If individuals really could be freed from the threatening ghosts of their past, then a new, more civilized kind of human being would emerge. Citizens of a new age, free for the first time from the power of history. Die Alliierten wollten dieses Stück Geschichte verdrängen, zerstören, annullieren und darin liegt ja ein gewisser magischer Akt. The heroes of this new age were the veterans who had fought and won the war. But many of them had secret memories that conflicted with the official version of the good war. Memories that gave a much more complex and frightening picture of what they had done. Those memories, after a while, they control you, you know. They come to you. So what happened? You think about what happened. You think about the bad things that happened over there. Because some of it is very bad. And then you got dreams, nightmares, you know. You hate people. You fly into a rage at the little, little thing, you know, the little, smallest thing. Bang, you know, you lose your temper. You hate the world. You stay by yourself. Hey, turn that off. Will you turn that thing off? What's eating you now? Yeah, what's eating you? That music, it stinks. Oh, you don't like it, huh? No, turn it off. Now, wait a minute, pal. There's clearly a conflict between individual memory and the big story, as you might put it, which was constructed out of a number of actual and very useful events. One was the trials at Nuremberg, which established the version of the good war, which is certainly true. On the other hand, shipping away at that constantly, is the secret version of the war which is possessed by the actual combat veterans. Did you ever want to forget anything? Did you ever want to cut away a piece of your memory or blot it out? You can't, you know, no matter how hard you try. You can change the scenery, but sooner or later you'll get a whip of perfume where somebody will say a certain phrase or maybe hum something. Then you're licked again. The problem is that the experience of the veterans is very largely depressing, pessimistic about human nature. It shows how awful human beings can be and how indeed how they can be brought to enjoy murder and enjoy depriving other people of their limbs and their lives. Now that's very bad news for human nature and it conflicts with the optimistic news which is conveyed by the official picture. Yes, go on. You remember it now? Many thousands of veterans had wiped their memories. The U.S. Army made a film record of the attempts to help them. It was kept hidden for over 40 years because it was considered bad for civilian morale. All right, go on. Don't lose it. You don't want any more. You want to forget it. But you're going to remember it because it's gone now. It's gone. 
You're back here now. You're away from Okinawa. You've forgotten it. But you remember who you are now. Who are you? Men who cannot remember. Paralyzed men whose paralysis is dictated by the mind. However different the symptoms, these things they have in common. Unceasing fear and apprehension. A sense of impending disaster. A feeling of hopelessness and utter isolation. Sort of the American dream, as they say, was not for you. You were an outsider. I couldn't have stood the idea of settling down in a nice family world. And I did try, and it didn't work. Then I had dreams, and those lasted for 40 years. Scenes of violence, death, uh, disfigurement, uh, horror, which I, I have always carried inside of me. And I feel that's the real possible world. That's the world at which, to which things can be reduced very easily. And this has made it hard for me to function easily in society uh, at times, because I always felt that I might be thrown back into that world. That's the real world. The, the, what the hell is this person talking to me like that? I'm going to take a rifle butt and smash his head in. I was always afraid of being reduced back to that. It is a world in which ideas uh, don't count for anything. Uh, sentiment doesn't count for anything. It's just dust back down to the <laughs> brutality of, of conflict. And that big secret world which you have to sort of bury, I suppose I buried that and buried a lot of memories with it. I wanted to get that down and out of it. It came back in dreams. <laughs> By the late 50s, Germany had become one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. She was also now America's ally in the Cold War. American attempts to denazify those who had run the country had been quietly dropped. Good bureaucrats and businessmen were needed to build a strong state against the Soviet threat. It was in everyone's interest to forget the past. Jetzt geht's hier wieder aufwärts mit uns. Und man hat es Schritt für Schritt gesehen. Man hat eine Wohnung bekommen, man hat sich satt essen können, man hat sich plötzlich Kleider kaufen können, man hat was verdient. Das war eine gewisse Euphorie. Und in dieser Euphorie haben sie nicht mehr sich bewusst an alles erinnert. Das wollten sie gar nicht mehr, das vorher war. Dieses, was im Hintergrund geblieben ist, das ist natürlich im Hintergrund geblieben. Das interessiert nicht mehr. Das ist vorbei. Wir haben es überstanden. Wir leben noch, Gott sei Dank. Und wollen darüber nicht mehr sprechen. Wir leben jetzt und jetzt für die Zukunft. Und wir sprechen eigentlich von dieser Zeit nicht viel. Das ist vorbei. Ich möchte eigentlich jetzt hier abbrechen. Ja. Recht ist, gell? The appearance you might get was that there had never been any Nazis. Nobody had known anything. Nobody had done anything wrong, and they were all sort of uh, innocently baffled by the whole thing. But when you started certain discussions in uh, narrower circles, where there was less fear of being pilloried for an utterance, there was a great deal of resentment of the injustice of the war. To them, this is a tremendous block of history where Germany was exploding like a nova, radiating across the globe, and, and that fascinates them. Deutschland, überall, überall in der Welt, 
Und dann kam sofort hinterher die nationalsozialistische Hymne, die hieß Die Fahne hoch, die Reihe dicht geschlossen. SA marschiert mit ruhig festem Schritt. Kameraden, die Rot Front und Reaktion erschossen, marschieren im Geist in unseren Reihen mit. Das mussten wir dann singen. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. Jetzt auf einmal ging es so zur Hymne. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. Und bis alles gesungen war, musste man da stehen, ob Frau, ob Mann, ob Kreis oder Kind. Und wenn das Lied fertig war, dann hat man es so gemacht, rührt euch. For the younger generation, those who had grown up in Germany in the years after the war, the past was completely mysterious. By the mid-sixties, a growing number of them began to ask questions about this strange time, a period of history that neither their teachers nor their parents would discuss. Then, in 1968, came the student revolution, and an attempt began to uncover the truth about Germany's hidden past. I think that in 68, with the student revolt, there was the memory knocking at the door. We were thinking as a generation which was, not, which was not guilty in a very direct sense of this word. And we asked, we asked our parents and our grandfathers, what did you do in all this time? Did you resist or had you been a little Nazi or had you been an opportunist? And <clears throat> this uh, discussion was blocked by the elder generation. And uh, so it became hostile. And so we were hunted and uh, pushed through the streets by the police and by the people in this town. Germany's past became a central issue for the student movement. Many began to delve into recent history, and what they discovered astounded them. Not only had their teachers and their parents been involved with the Nazi party, but many appeared to have taken part in crimes. There were terrible confrontations within families. Und die Jugend, die dann kommt, immer nur sieht, das wurde begangen und ist nicht dazugefügt worden. Aber dein Großvater kann im Einzelnen gar nichts dafür, dass mich die Jungen fragen, meine Neffen mit 22 und 26 Jahren, ja, wir werden mit der Schuldzuweisung unserer Großväter überhaupt nicht fertig. Die ältere Generation hat sich davor gefürchtet, dass nun abgerechnet wird, dass also jeder, wenn man erst mal anfängt bei einem, also sagt, der war bei der SS, wo war er, dass diejenigen, die neben ihm sitzen, gefragt werden, und wo waren sie und sie, diese Angst mit in deinen Sog rein zu geraten, hat natürlich eine Solidarität unter den Älteren geschaffen, über diese Zeit nicht zu reden. Die haben uns nie gefragt, meine Neffen und Nichten, was habt ihr gelitten? Das ist es ja. Nach unseren Leiden ist nicht gefragt worden, sondern nur das, was wir, was wir nach außen hin gemacht haben. Das ist sehr erlebig von der Jugend, ja. It was a complete confrontation. One part of this people against the other. Ach, das ist... The students were convinced that what they had uncovered was a hidden continuity with the Third Reich. Beneath the facade of a liberal democratic country, the fascist state had continued, run by the very same men and women who had administered Hitler's regime. The group emerged determined to expose this. They were led by Andreas Bader and Gudrun Enslin. Their aim was to resist fascism where their parents had failed. They were known as the Red Army Faction. Dieser Staat hat, wie Sie es nannten, eine faschistische Fresse, die nur mit einer Maske verhüllt ist. Und Sie haben, das war Ihre Theorie, wenn man den, den, äh, den verschleierten Faschismus zeigen will, muss man ihnen nur die, die Maske vom Gesicht reißen. Und das geht nur, indem man sie angreift. The Red Army Faction embarked on a series of bombings and shootouts with the police. Their strategy was to use violence to provoke the state into exposing its true identity.
But as the violence escalated, some of the terrorist leaders began to have doubts. In trying to expose Germany's hidden past, they had unearthed something far more complex and far more sinister than they had bargained for. I had begun to realize that uh, fighting against the state by armed groups with this uh, revolutionary strategy in, in mind was uh, bringing up uh, fascistic tendence, tendencies in the reaction not only uh, uh, of the political class, but of the people too. We ourselves became in the same way fascistic as the fascists were. We didn't realize that our enemies, our opponents, are human beings. This is what is in the heart fascism. The oppression of other meanings of the political opposition and uh, oppression means elimination by killing. Was it frightening when you realized that that was happening? Yeah, of course, awfully frightening. This is one, one of the main uh, points in the development. Um, the awareness that we are from the same stuff as the fascists were. We understood something. We understood that fascism is a component in all of us. Do you think that's what we hid from ourselves at the end of the war? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. We, we have a picture of ourselves. We want to be good. We want to be human creatures with the positive uh, thinkings and so on. But uh, we are a contradiction in ourselves because we don't know to handle this contradiction. We don't have any mean to, to live with this evil part in ourselves. In the autumn of 1977, the leaders of the Bader Meinhof group committed suicide in jail. The attempt to change Germany by opening up its past was over. The threatening memories were reburied. The memory is a swamp, like this building is like this building is built in a swamp, swampy area. So in the, uh, in a swamp, some something comes up, makes a make, makes a sound a noise boop. you smell something and then uh, once again the surface is clean and clear and so this memory comes up sometimes gives a noise gives a bad smell and then the surface is clean again but then ten years later the course of European history suddenly changed communist domination of Eastern Europe collapsed. In the summer of 1990, Berlin celebrated the dismantling of the wall with a concert given by Pink Floyd. During the preparations, hidden fragments of the past came to the surface. In the no-man's land between the two Berlins, a forgotten Nazi bunker was unearthed. It was found by chance when uh, here Pink Floyd has the great spectacle the wall in the summer uh, 90. And they telephoned me because I told them before one could find something. And that was the beginning of the battle for safeguarding this bunker. And what did you find down there? Can you show us some of the things? Yes, we, uh, there are some small objects, of course. So here is a bayonet. We only uh, took some samples here, silver spoon, it was from the official silver. These fragments, it was like a, fro a frozen moment of history, 50 years ago. This frozen moment of apocalypse, the end of history, of a certain part of history. It wasn't just fragments of the Nazi past that re-emerged. 
As the Cold War came to an end, a hidden history of Europe was awakened. Old rivalries and tensions, suppressed for 50 years, were rekindled. With them came the barbarism and the evil that the good war was supposed to have banished forever. The infantry then went on a foot patrol to look for more casualties or evidence of atrocities. They didn't have far to search. They came upon a house in the centre of the village where a family of seven had died, two in the stairway, another five in the cellar. It's hard to look at some of these pictures, harder to tell the story of Ahanichi without them. What happened here can frankly not be shown in any detail, but the room is full of the charred remains of bodies and they died in the greatest agony. It's hard to imagine in our continent and in our time what kind of people could do this. I just kept thinking that, uh, you know, there were people once, you know. I mean, this is, you know, this is Europe, 1993, not 1943. The fragments of the past that have re-emerged in Europe are frightening because they are linked to a time many thought had long been buried and forgotten. But history will not repeat itself. These forgotten pieces will be reassembled to tell a new story. They will be used to justify the new political ideas. We are at zero hour once again. What the hell is that? Maybe something trying to force its way into our world.